We return to the tale of the industrious rogue and his party. We left off with the group on a quest to find the hag, ever scowling Calpurnia, to help the party track down the dreamers. So I get to have a chance to send these guys on a normal adventure again, this time to meet ever scowling Calpurnia in a long forgotten grotto somewhere in a collapsing demiplane in the deep ethereal, filled with all manners of dreams gone very wrong. Basically, tentacles. Tentacles everywhere where they are confronted with a few requests that involve some cosmological hitchhiking and a challenge inspired by Plato's analogy of the divided line. Greek philosophy is great material for symbolic riddles. Long story short, Calpurnia hands them over a bag of terror's dust, which when sprinkled nearby a materializing dream creates a silvery trail that can lead to the mind from which it sparks. There's a minotaur with four arms there. Sprinkle some dust on him. And over that tree filled with swords. Oh, and that is a room filled with gold pieces too. Essentially, I had to spend one hour making up random dreamscapes as the party decided to go on a dream hunt in the mirage-choked desert trying to find stuff they wanted to make real. A dreamscape, which is a region of space where dreams take form when remaining in existence for long enough, meaning the people dreaming as content do so for extended periods of time, can materialize. Since this normally only happens in the deep ethereal, the results very rarely have any sort of impact in the multiverse. Besides from some odd abominations made of ether and the like, but if for some reason a dreamscape formed in a planar locale containing actual elemental matter, well, that's another thing. As it can be guessed, their plan was to find the owners of these interesting dreams and manage to keep them dreaming for long enough for these to materialize. The salt spit dreamscape was filled with all manners of odd, amazing, and terrifying things, as dreams and nightmares often are. And several of them had started to take a wee bit of physical embodiment in the way of swirling shapes of dust, sand, and salt which meant the team of Vudrani illusionists had to be put to work on double duty to minimize the impact. Still, the gold Imam Salim al-Salam was managed to stir some trouble in town. Whenever they saw something that piqued their interest, particularly stuff dealing with oversized gems, monsters they could use to open a battle arena, and dreams about well-hidden artifacts and the means to get to them, like I'm going to put one of those there, they would send Vorgok to sprinkle the dust, which earned him the new nickname of the Pain Fairy, the player being the player behind Vorgok, who was really enjoying playing a deranged barbarian, was overjoyed with the ethereal blast that got him acting even more odd. And this led to some pretty amusing situations including, but not restricted to, a reenactment of Don Quixote, where Vorgok would tilt at rocks and attempt to rescue a piece of wood he deemed Dulcinea, along with a sorrowful scene when he accidentally broke it. The reason they sent him is because some of the nightmares could prove to be dangerous and mind-twisting. And really, there was no physical or mental blow Vorgok couldn't stand, the former because of his sheer HP pool, the second because of his lack of room for additional insanity. I wasn't going to make it so easy, but truth be told, I was enjoying all of these crazy plans, so I gave them some chances in the form of a 1d100. If the result was under 20%, the dream they sprinkled the terror's dust over would be coming from someone in Galarian. After all, dreams can come from any dreaming mind in the multiverse. If so, I would then roll 2d1000, and the result would indicate the number of kilometers away from where the dream was being had. One kilometer equals 0.6 miles, by the way. Calpurnia's bag only had eight uses, though, so there was a good chance of not finding any dream within a reasonable distance or even within their same plane of existence. However, they got lucky on two dreams or nightmares. A horrible and enormous shapeless thing covered in teeth that spout out other shapeless things covered in teeth. Basically, a gibbering mouth or the size of a house. It ended up being in the screaming jungles in eastern Sergavia, which was about 1,500 miles away. The Fountain of Liquid Gold, which ended up being in Jalmaray, Rakim's homeland, which is about 400 miles away. Not hard to see which one they wanted to go after first. There was some administrative stuff to settle first, though, and the rest of that session was dedicated to the following. The Salt Operation. Whipmaster Concaf, a cyclops they bought in Katapesh, very big and very bad at depth perception, and great at workforce motivation, complained that the slaves at the mines were too weak. As it turned out, Candasar had been shipping six slaves, and now there was the risk of an epidemic. Concaf had been breaking some spines to instill morale, but the men were too weak. On the good side, one of the byproducts of the planar accident was the restitution of the original portal conduct, and salt was pouring out once more as well as salt para elementals, some of which had been terrorizing the local population, like in the good old days. The Brass Legion, Hranov, the Olfen, in charge of handling the 60-some mercenaries, demanded better living conditions for his men. Among other things, he wanted an increase in six copper pieces per day of work for each of his men, private latrines, the salt-spit crap houses, or the public latrines set up in the early days of the city, were infamous for being so foul 
that some people literally died due to the noxious gases while using them, and the right to one harlot each week for every man that would be chosen from the city's winching houses. The final agreement included a raise of two silver pieces a week, plus another five for the ten best performing mercenaries. This was Jack's idea. The performance would be determined through a system where all the mercenaries would be divided between the four districts of Saltspit in which they operated. Then, the local population would vote for those members of the Legion they considered had done a good job. Yeah, he's the bard. And a musician, indie movie maker in real life. Sharp thinking about these things is not his forte. This soon spiraled into an epidemic of leg-breaking, house-burning, and torture. All in the name of sound, healthy democracy, of course. The rest of the deal went on about the private latrines. Eight would be built, two in each district. The Brass Legion would be in charge of upkeep, though, which essentially meant they would bully the locals for it or drown them in crap and the wenches. This last part caused some friction, since Forgok, who as previously mentioned had the right to prima nocta for every new wench in Salspit, had become very attached to the Harlot community, and in fact was quite well received by them, and he refused to diminish them so much. In the end, though, Hronov was inflexible about his men's necessities, and it was settled that three wenches would be sent each night to the Legion's headquarters in the bazaar, generously provided by Al Sharingan's Pavilion of Pleasure, but the men would have to share it. City planning. Salspit had grown, Indeed, nearly 6,000 people lived there, and more kept coming, making it the third largest settlement in the region, after Katapesh, around 200,000, and Okano, around 13,000. It had also grown into a full-fledged trading nexus, with all the wealth produced directly or indirectly by the STC spilling over to hundreds of other business activities. With caravans going in and out non-stop carrying all sorts of goods, from Catherine silk to Thuvian wine and Nexian glowstones and black powder from Alkenstar, slaves from Katapesh, and even the occasional load of tobacco from the unknown reaches of southern Garund. All this prosperity was starting to cause more than one headache. Magistrate Kamal al kafesh had recently been dispatched from Katapesh to sort out the urban status of Saltspit. Was it a city? Did it recognize the primacy of the pact masters and pact brokers? Did it abide by the highly flexible Katapeshi legal system? Was trade being protected? Who handled crime? Where were the criminals being sent? And a long list of other things. You can't just make a city out of nowhere and expect things to take care of themselves, were the magistrate's words. Katapesh was demanding proper recognition of the authority, and al had been instructed to assist the local de facto governing body, the Salspit Trading Company, in the proper organization of the city. Districts have to be regulated, main streets named, public buildings designated. Far more concerned with a fountain that sprang liquid gold, Hassan basically waved him off, saying, Magistrate, you can take as much gold as the strongest man you can find can carry from our vaults in exchange for taking care of this whole situation. Hold on, hold on, interrupted Rakim. This is important. Saltspit is our center of operations. We can't just hand wave its administration. What we need is a city council. Eventually, after some talking, the party agreed to Rakim's idea. They would form a city council drawn from the people they could trust, which would be given the responsibility of managing the day-to-day aspects of Saltspit. In the end, they decided to summon Al Sharingan, the local kingpin, to be in charge of all things commercial. Nidaros, priest from the Church of Desna that was a good friend of the party, especially after they saved him from a cult of man-eaters when they were level 2. Abdul Bel Nabir, one of Prince Osman's most trusted advisors to take on the adjudication of law. Lendis Musburger, the shrewd but quiet clever manager of the local branch of Andorin Trading Company Hudsucker, dedicated to adventuring gear and the main provider of rope and caltrops for the party since level 1. The party met him during one of their first real jobs. They started off as slaves after being captured by Knowles at the start of the campaign when their vessel shipwrecked. He would oversee urban planning and Horolf, the leader of the Brass Legion, to handle leg breaking. With all those things taken care of, they set up to travel to Jalmaray in order to meet the owner of the dream. Although the figment in question had disappeared, quite awful Giselda, a dream consultant provided by the Night Hags, explained that once a dream has been created in a mind, it can be recalled. So, if they managed to find the person who sprang it, she could assist them in reproducing it. At that point, Jack wondered, why couldn't they just dream cool stuff by themselves? To which Valinar replied, Because we would have to be kept asleep for Savannah knows how long. Although, thinking about it, you could be a great candidate for that. There was also the issue that only a specific dreamscape had been brought over into Galarian, and the chances of their dreams existing in that particular region were next to none. Since the party was going to visit Jalmaray, they traveled back to Katapesh to hire a ship, and took the chance to visit the prince, the emir, and other friends. At this point, Rakim was informed that his beloved Falbala, the elven priestess he had become close with, was pregnant. 
So he decided that from now on, she would be within sight whenever possible. So she would go with them to Jalmeray, which was also Rakim's homeland, and he wanted her to see it. So they travel to Jalmeray, meet with Rakim's parents, who were of course pleased with Falbala and the child, but very displeased with Rakim for making child with no parental consent. They left the elf at their house, did some sightseeing, and eventually got to their purpose, to find the mind that about a week ago was dreaming about fountains of liquid gold. The silvery dust trail was still visible, and it led into one of the more populated areas of Patiskar, the second largest city in the island nation. So they scout around trying to follow the silver dust trail, which didn't really make it easy for them either, as it flew over buildings, and finally saw it entering through a window. They had waited until very late in the night in order to hopefully find the person already asleep in case they had to get more convincing, as if, hey, we need to knock you unconscious for a month so a witch from another dimension can prod your brain in order for your dreams to come true so that we may steal them afterward, wasn't a convincing proposition to begin with. Level 9 by then, Hassan had little trouble opening the locks and getting inside without making any noise, and he found the dreaming person, a thin, sick child about 8 years old with a lame leg, sleeping atop a badly crafted box with some hay sprinkled on it to simulate a bed. The poor kid breathed heavily from the fever, and his forehead was covered in sweat. Great, this makes it way easier. So Hassan takes the chloroform he bought from Katapeshi merchants and puts it over the kid's mouth to make sure he won't wake up, ties him up inside a blanket, and runs out. No. No way I'm going to agree with that. Rakim wasn't too pleased to see the adorable thing Hassan had just kidnapped. It's a kid. So, when did you grow a conscience? Was it when we began incarcerating people for getting a bad haircut so they could work in our salt mines? Or when we sent an Ableth insanity fishing into the wrong side of reality so we could fill them with nightmares that would make you pee through your ears, said Hassan. Valinar was smiling. No, I know what's really going on. He walked closer. This reminds him of the child his very own elven mistress is carrying as we speak, doesn't it? The priest had been waiting a long time to take advantage of the romance. He cannot stop thinking this could be his, that little brown, pointy-eared half-breed the son of an incontinent excuse for a monk and a priestess with no control of her loins, a harlot in the guise of a saint. He's interrupted by Rakim, who goes all a flurry of blows on him. Shock! Conflict! Rakim decides that he's not taking part of this anymore and goes away. Jack, who had been getting doubts about himself, eventually follows suit. Should we stop him? asks Hassan. All bruised, Valinar stands up. No need to. In fact, this might be exactly what I needed. The player asked me if during the short fight he got any blood from Rakim on him, to which I answer positively. And he always has sharp blades under his scarf. That could have cut him up a bit. That's his favorite priest weapon, by the way. A bladed scarf. Don't ask me. Valinar grinned like he had never grinned before. Tell me, Hassan, how much are rubies worth these days? To understand Valinar's reference, I need to momentarily take you guys back to the early stages of the campaign, when the party was around level 2 or 3 the beginning of this story. When they went back to the Assyrian temple with the salt rift, because it has a bit of a complicated origin, it is customary for my players to work with me in private when they want to get involved in conspiracies, odd plans, and the like, this particular subplot had been devised in conjunction with Valinar's player, and eventually with Rakim's player too. We don't screw over other characters' story without express approval. The best part of these things are the expressions on the other players' faces when it's all revealed, usually leading to a series of revelations of all the hidden stuff people had going on. This whole story is one great example of all that. Hassan's player keeps me constantly posted with ideas and long-term plans, which are not always revealed properly to the rest of the party. Around those days, the party was involved in the investigation of a series of ugly murders in which the victims were all boiled down and stripped of their flesh. Initially, it all seemed to be tied to a bunch of crazy cannibals that worshipped Ugatha, Galarian's goddess of undeath, gluttony and disease, living beneath the sewers of Katapesh the same guys who had kidnapped Nidoros, the half-eaten fellow mentioned before that was now part of the Salt Spit City Council. At the climax of that particular plot, the party managed to escape the cultists through an underground river, but Valinar got left behind because he was checking some relics in the inner quarters of the cultists' high priest. Long story short, Valinar was almost eaten alive, but through some very clever ideas and role-playing, this player has quite the knack for solving almost every possible scenario through diplomacy, blackmailing, and not healing his party. I honestly can't remember the last time he picked up a weapon in D&D or a Pathfinder campaign. He managed to talk his way out of it, and the high priest eventually offered him a deal. His life, and more importantly, immortal soul, in exchange for a host. 
Now, the explanation the high priest gave to Valinar was very cryptic and confusing, but it gave him just enough information to be able to do additional research on his own. As it turned out, none of that had anything to do with Urgotha. The cult was merely a tool for a more obscure and convoluted plot involving none other than the denizens of Lang, creatures hailing from a mysterious and terrifying realm that in scant volumes mentioned it seems to be suggested as the last remnant of a long-collapsed reality prior even to the current multiverse. The denizens of Lang do have a presence in Galarian, and several of them exist hidden among the courts of the mighty, influencing the course of history with goals no one understands. They are also not strangers in Katapesh, where they dabble in selective slave trade. For some reason, they seem highly interested in specific kinds of people, which they trade for absurdly valuable rubies, or at least that's what everyone thinks are rubies. Personally, they kind of remind me of the Yugolos and their endless quest to experiment and discover the true nature of evil. The kind of villains that are not really bad guys, just uncaring entities for which mortals are just yet another tool in their repertoire. In secret, and without the knowledge of the rest of the party, Valinar started meeting with envoys from the High Priest. Random individuals whose minds had been blanked out and honestly seemed more like puppets made of flesh and bone. And slowly he began understanding what was going on. The High Priest wasn't working for anyone in particular, but for himself. As it happens, the denizens of Lang are beings whose bodies are made out of malleable, fleshy substance they can control at will. Which is one of the reasons they are really ugly when relaxed. But existing too long away from Lang, or regions of the multiverse that are somehow connected to Lang, has detrimental effects on said bodies. So the High Priest, trapped in Galarian since time immemorial, had been working on a means to fix that shortcoming. So far, stealing the flesh of certain individuals he had previously identified as useful had helped as a patch measure. But he was getting close to a point where he could simply no longer sustain his physical form, so he needed a host. To this end, the high priest had been dabbling in the creation of a perfect host capable of sustaining the twisted essence of a denizen of Lang, one that would be able to sustain itself in Galarian without decomposing into sticky black jelly, something no other denizen had been able to manage so far. Valinar found out during his investigations that there were many other denizens interested in such a solution, but they were all too fragmented to work together. For this host to work out, however, it would have to be conceived through a natural process. The high priest had been trying to implant the host into pregnant women kidnapped from the city above, but it all ended up horribly. But now, there was Valinar. What he had to do was get the host, which was nothing more than a thick reddish liquid, into a man that would have to then impregnate not any woman, but an elf. Something which was hard to find in Katapesh, as the high priest figured out the slower aging rate of elves in their natural immortality make up for the quick degeneration the host suffered during gestation. Valinar smiled, knowing exactly who to use. Now, the romance between Rakim and Fabella would seem awfully convenient, if not for the fact that it didn't exist at this point, nor was it meant to happen. Falbella was a priestess, and a chaste one at that, the party did not know her and Valinar knew Rakim had shown restrained interest. He was a monk from Jalmare, with all that stuff about body perfection and purity. But everything was on a strict friend zone level. But Valinar knew some alchemists, and the player knew that the saving throws of both should be rather low at the point in the campaign. So he spent almost all of his money in getting a love potion made, making sure that the alchemist accidentally poured more of certain components than what was advised. And that is how, during a trip to a deserted settlement, Rakim and Fabella kept him mysteriously disappearing at nights and seemed awfully relaxed the next day. With the two bastions of purity now shaking like there was no tomorrow, getting the host into Rakim's was child's play. Just add some raspberry and bam, you have the iconic healing potion, if a bit thicker than one would expect. Then, Valinar, with the enormous patience that characterizes the player behind him, waited for things to take on to their natural course. He knew it would take very long. Adventures, journeys, and levels would come and go before getting any result. But if everything went according to plan, which, as I hope you would have presumed by now, wasn't exactly in the same line as the high priests, it would be well worth the wait. Let's go back to where we left off. Valinar had been quite glad when they got the news about Falbella being pregnant. Even though elven pregnancies are supposed to last about two years, this wasn't problematic. The high priest had informed him that the host would develop at an incredibly rapid rate, and, truth is, Falbella was quite swollen. She was six months into pregnancy and had been abnormally exhausted, which was also to be expected. In fact, the host should only require three to four months of gestation, after which it would remain there, living off the mother's vital energies until she could go no longer. 
This is why elves were such a good idea. At this point in the story, he trusted Hassan's unending thirst for money enough that he felt comfortable with sharing his plan. He needed Falabella's offspring in order to use it as a bargaining chip with the other denizens of Lang he had tracked throughout all of his time. He knew of at least six in Katapesh and many more that occasionally visited the city. There was in fact an entire slave trading company controlled by three of them. He had no intention of handing it over to the high priest, whose agents had long become just a footnote now that he was considerably more powerful and resourceful than he was at level three. That is why the trip to Jalmare had to be such a boon, and why Valinar had been so mindful of reminding Rakim that he would do whatever he could as a priest to keep her comfortable and safe, as it would allow him to carry on with the extraction without the risk of the high priest meddling. Hassan pondered. It was an ugly business. Sure, they had been using people as nightmare farms, forced good Katapeshi citizens into a life of slavery at the salt mines, and now they even kidnapped a kid because they needed the dreams he had. But now they were talking about Rakim's and Falbella's kid, the former a companion of adventures, and the latter being the priestess that helped them survive and escape the authorities. Maybe it was too much. The denizens of Lang carry with them otherworldly rubies that go beyond any kind of gem you can imagine. Not even the emir and his elemental associates could produce something like them. Valinar was, of course, leaving out the part about the enormous influence said denizens had over many nations of Galarian. He wasn't after money. He wanted real power. Don't think of the children. Think of the rubies. But Hassan was still thinking. What Valinar didn't know is that Hassan was now not really thinking about the moral consequences. He was wondering if they weren't going to waste a unique opportunity. No, we are not going to give it out that easily. There is an opportunity here, said Hassan, coming out of his thoughts. Valinar was rather confused. What? Of course there is. We get the baby out, we hide it well, we contact some denizens, and we offer them the deal, giving it to the one who offers the most. My friend, what have we learned so far? That Hassan knows how to make money out of everything. He tapped his nose. And when Hassan finds a source of money, he makes sure that more will come after. Let me explain. So there, in the warm, starry night of Jalmare, in a beautiful garden in which plants grew in impossible manners and a small waterfall ran upward, he told him what he was thinking about. Mass production of hosts. In which Valinar had explained about Fabella being the proper way to get these hosts working was correct. Then they were going to replicate the process. Why auction one baby among several denizens, who could probably kill them and take it, when they could be making one for each of them? That's a lot more rubies, plus avoiding enemies from a dimension severed from a dead universe within the fathoms of time could be well seen as a positive externality of the transaction. Valinar was both confused and amazed by Hassan's plan. He saw the logic and he liked it, just that he had never thought of taking it to the next level. Things would get interesting now. Indeed they would. So Valinar and Hassan had decided what to do. They would kidnap Fobala in order to steal her child and hopefully find a way to replicate the process. Vorgok was there too, but it was hard to tell if he was even aware of what was going on as he kept talking to imaginary friends and staring in awe at a magnificent woolly mammoth that wasn't even there. I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but back when the party was going along with the original plot, they had to deal with a band of ritual assassins that kept trying to dispose of them or frame them with murders. The assassins had been hired by one of the many crazy doomsday cults that were fighting over a very important artifact the players had, and attempted to sway the party into their side by argument, force, or highly volatile narcotics. They were the original cause of the party leaving Katapesh early on. The thing is, the way they took them out of the equation was striking a deal with their leader, a mind flayer by the name of Essek. It was essentially a, whatever they pay you, we can double it solution. Valinar had been in charge of said deal, he has the best diplomacy and bluff in the party, plus various argument effective spells such as read thoughts and zone of truth. And throughout the campaign, kept contact with them in secret, just in case they ever needed the services of a centuries-old order of green-wearing assassins and kidnappers, which was precisely what they needed now. The idea was to have the Order of the Green Veil kidnap Falbala, while Valinar and Hassan did their best to keep Rakim away from her. The Sonk just knew far too much delicate information about their operations, aside from being legally entitled to a big part of it through his share of the STC, and they could not risk him knowing that they were behind the whole thing. So they set up a situation involving an escaped genie from one of the local training schools in order to keep the party stuck in Jelmeray for about a week, enough to have the Green Vale's agents kidnap Fabella from Rakim's parents' house. 
They also had them take the kid in order to pacify the song. Hassan simulated having felt second thoughts and leaving the kid behind when Rakim went there to check. They had to steal another kid from another house with similar characteristics, put him to sleep with magic, and use disguise to make it seem like he was the same. Since Rakim had only seen him for a few moments, it worked. As you can imagine, there was much ruckus when Rakim found out that the Green Veil struck back, and this time they stole the elf carrying Rakim Jr. As he was never fully aware of how the assassins had been dealt with in the past. In fact, no one knew, except for Hassan, to whom Valinar revealed the truth when they concocted the plan a week ago. He took it as a personal vendetta, shaking an angry fist to the sky and all that, and pressed to quickly abandon everything they were doing and head back to Katapesh, where the Green Veil's base of operations was. Once there, he stormed every single place they had previously discovered to be somehow tied to the organization, trashing several stores and smokehouses. The rest of the party followed suit, but Hassan and Valinar knew they wouldn't find her, as they had given specific orders to Essek for Falbala and the kid to be sent to Saltspit and hidden until they arrived. However, things quickly got complicated, in a few words. Rakim found out where she was by using the same means they had previously used to track down Essek, crystal spheres through which the assassins communicated. Yes, yes, they also made a lot of Sauron jokes the first time they found it. They got to Saltspit, trashed Al Sharingan's safe house, which had been used by the assassins to hide the hostages, tortured everything that could be tortured to know what happened, earning some points toward an alignment shift, but not quite there yet since it was balanced out by the ultimate goal. Eventually found out what was going on, choked us on to death, as in quite dead, not just below zero, and demolished his face with his bare hands before getting knocked unconscious by Vorgok, who had a very hazy general picture of what was going on. He was also becoming less and less solid as time progressed, unsure of what was real and what wasn't. Through sheer expenditure of money, and cashing in favors with big shots in Katapesh, the party had Hassan revived. Resurrection is a very, very hard and complicated thing to do in my campaigns. But they were very, very rich as well, so it was within reach. One of Hassan's eyes was destroyed during the fight, however, so he had to replace it with another one made out of pure gold. As for Rakim, well, that would come. For now, their longtime adventuring companion would remain jailed deep within the STC headquarters, pumped with all manners of alchemical concoctions to keep him weak and in a semi-conscious state. Since they were in Katapesh for Hassan's resurrection, they might as well get some business going. Rather than breaking into madness fits, Hassan sent an envoy to Saltspit to get Rakim's signature, which he used to forge a will in which Rakim, who allegedly died from a slow, painful death caused by a severe case of choleric fever he caught in Jamare, designated his shares of the STC as preferential for society withholders which essentially meant that the current living owners of the STC, Valinar, Hassan, Vorgok, Jack, the Prince, Honest Abdul, and a host of other minor shareholders who had been joining the ranks of the company as time went by, had the right to buy them, and if none wished, they would then be sent to an auction house to be sold to the highest bidder. By offering money to the rest of the owners, Hassan bought Rakim shares for himself and became the leading stockholder. Jack wanted to protest, but he had been threatened by the rogue after he tried to defend Rakim, and he knew they could dispose of him at any moment. Valinar had no quibbles since being the leading stockholder meant that he would have to dedicate more time to directing the company and he had other things to worry about. And for Vorgok, all these earthly things meant little. I saw no light at the end of the tunnel, Valinar, Hassan said after he was revived. But I didn't see fire either. I take that as simply not being my moment. Let's get back to business. While Valinar took care of contacting denizens of Lang from different guards of Garund, Hassan went to work on the technical aspects of the new business venture. So, first there was the thing with the Golden Fountain. Quite awful Giselda had been tasked with setting up all that was necessary to send the kid into a perpetual dreaming state. In a small tower they had built north of Saltspit for that purpose. She warned him that once the kid was sent into such a deep sleep, waking him up later would most likely result in his death. Just get me that Golden Fountain, which was all Hassan replied before leaving. Falbala's case was a bit trickier. Valinar explained all he knew about the process developed by the Flesh Eater's High Priest, and together they made a list of things they saw as essential. These were the substance used to influence the host. Valinar had wisely kept some of it, although it had already decayed. To replicate it, they hired a contingent of Katapesh's finest alchemists, necromancers, and apothecaries, who worked day and night until they managed to create a copy. There were lots of ugly accidents, of course, and even more to come once they established production and to that end they had a huge pit-built salt spit to dispose of the flesh spawns. So basically my players were setting down the first stones for a future dungeon. I love these bastards. 
Elven Women As mentioned before, the life energy that runs through elves and makes them immortal is perfect for the severe drain that the accelerated development of the host causes on the mother, so they would need to somehow get more of those. Getting people against their will wasn't really much of a challenge, but the fact that the elves were so scarce this far south made things tricky. Through the Brass Legion, Hassan made contact with a band of mercenaries known as Banner's Bastards, which operated in southern Avistan, the northern continent which could be the equivalent of Europe in Galarian terms. Remember, Katapesh is in the eastern Garund, which is Galarian's Africa. Now that I think of it, Katapesh seems awfully similar to Zanzibar. They would be tasked with capturing elves from Kionin, an elven kingdom far to the north, as well as any other elf they could find. Women would be worth 1,000 gold pieces each, men 200. Hassan thought that using elves on both sides of the process would maybe increase the life energy available. They were going to capture the pointy-eared things anyway, might as well use them for something. I still clearly remember the discussion he had with one of Banner's envoys, who came with the first load of elves. No, no, these ones are clearly male. Look, you added fake breasts. And did you check between their legs? What, nothing? Let me see. These won't do. I'm not paying for male elves made to look like female elves. Take these back and tell Banner that I'm not going to get scammed this easily. The Nursery Beyond the fact that these babies are pretty ugly, the denizens of Langer, creatures whose bodies are made out of malleable flesh, which they can control with their minds, are unusually tall, with elongated extremities and mouths that look like anemones. Now mix that with a human and an elf, yeah, not pretty at all. But they still had to be kept alive. Falbala's offspring showed that development occurred very fast. In the span of two months, it had grown from what the hell is that thing to what the hell is that thing. And their dietary needs quickly went from what one would expect from a human or an elf baby into not needing food at all. However, since the high priest had designed these as blank hosts, they also became rather unsettling. Since they had no mind of their own, being essentially large vegetables which had spontaneous bursts of reactive behavior to basic needs. So a nursery was built to accommodate these, with female slaves brought from Canisar to take care of the feeding and caring, and those who went nuts from the situation were shipped to the nightmare bunkhouses. Everything was functioning like clockwork. In the meanwhile, in total it took about five months of in-game time, even though it spanned one and a half session. Quite awful Giselda had successfully managed to materialize the Vudrani kids' dreams, and an impressive dreamscape in the outskirts of Saltspit now displayed a fountain from which liquid gold sprang. It was extremely hot, however, and involved a series of other issues, since when dreams become material, they also try to conform to the laws of nature as much as possible. But the fact was the STC now controlled the only liquid gold fountain in the world. Salt, nightmares, malformed extra-dimensional babies. Boy, liquid gold. Hassan could barely contain his own happiness. We discussed it for a while, and ultimately came to the agreement that the fountain poured gold at a rate equal to that of a fountain that used to be in our school, which we had to measure back in the 90s as part of a physics assignment. 4 cubic meters per hour, or 66 liters per minute, and at a temperature of 1,000 degrees Celsius, or about 1,900 degrees Fahrenheit, at a liquid density of 17 grams per centimeters cubed. And taking into consideration that one pound of gold is worth 50 gold pieces in Pathfinder, that resulted in their wallets engrossing 33,660 gold per hour, which is approximately the equivalent wealth per level of an 8th level character, or a bit less than that of a 20th level character per day. At this point, I distinctly remember Jack's reaction. Isn't that too much money? Only to be slapped by Hassan. No, it's not. As you can imagine, realizing how ridiculously wealthy they were getting by the fountain alone kind of relegated the other venues to a secondary spot, because even all the other businesses combined could not produce the fabulous amount of money that the fountain spewed like it was going out of style. That is not to say they were abandoned. Valinar certainly had more important things in mind than just hard cash, but instead made the protection, sustenance, and monetization of the fountain all the more important. Plans were abounding, and the numbers started to get ludicrous. First, there was a monetization issue. Sure, it was a fountain of gold, but it wasn't precisely a matter of just reaching in and paying out. Word was spreading across Saltspit that the STC was hiring construction workers to erect a new smelting facility, as gold had supposedly been found while digging a new tunnel. They got some architects and engineers from Katapesh to come and design the thing, and a site was selected north of the city. The plan was to build the facility right on top of the fountain, but the issue of the dreams materializing in the area made it impossible. Instead, a permanent portal was created to carry the liquid gold from the fountain and into the mining plant, all kept to a very tight circle to avoid news of the fountain existing. Of course, a few weeks later, 
Everyone and their mothers had received word of the findings, and Saltzbeth began experiencing a gold rush that spiked both population growth and bar fight rates. Hooker intakes alone were so high that Vorgok himself was unable to keep up. Soon, every ravine, crack in the ground, water puddle, and tiny creek was crawling with gold diggers, from Varicia to Sargava, which stretched Saltzbeth's resources and capacity to a breaking point. On the good side, however, it served as a smokescreen for what was actually going on, and the increased influx of inhabitants gave some extra benefits in terms of slaves for the nightmare bunkhouses. I told the party the facility would take about three months to get built to a point of proper operation, and we agreed to have their earnings slowly escalate as it became functional, starting from zero and reaching full capacity of about 800,000 gold per day in 90 days. An army of 50 iron golems was commissioned to the great tinkerers of Alkenstar. Valinar was keenly aware that the secrecy and prudence had been thrown out the window when they decided to let dreams come true near their headquarters. And he wanted to be prepared for what could happen once the real dealings of the STC came into public light. Besides, he had wanted to get his own golem ever since the game started. Due to the sheer size of the order, the STC got a 10% bulk price discount, and that still set them back about 6.75 million gold pieces and the artisans demanded an upfront payment of half that amount since they still recalled the cancelled order for the Zeppelin. By then, the SDC had accumulated a wealth of about 1.5 million gold pieces, so they had to request loans from the Katapeshi lenders. Honest Abdul had become one of the richest men in the region thanks to his dealings with the STC, so he agreed to lend them the 2 million gold pieces they requested. Though for that, he had to pretty much drain the coffers of almost every counting house and bank in the city. However, the logistics of moving those amounts of money had created a whole new world of problems, Remember that 50 gold equals 1 pound, so the 50% payment of Alkenstar had a total weight of 67,500 pounds. Part of it was reduced to better forms of wealth transfer, such as jewels, but due to the sheer numbers, not even a city like Katapesh was able to provide the vast amounts needed in such short notice, and Bin Fishar's company was simply not able to meet the demand without raising suspicion on his extra-dimensional dealings. Overall, I allowed them to reduce the total weight by about 30%. However, the process caused a massive market dump in Katapesh. Devaluing the gold standard and making the prices of gems, spices, and other traditional wealth commodities explode. The merchant court was in utter chaos, as while some merchants saw their wallets grow fat, others were having severe issues meeting their quotas. Luxury exports, the lifeblood of Katapesh grinded to a halt, causing whole fleets to stand idle in the ports, which in turn flooded the city with angry drunken sailors with nothing to do and little cash to spend. With the captains refusing to sail with their holds empty, the sea trading lanes began to collapse, both because the piers were choked with moored vessels, and because a big part of it depended on those same ships that exported the goods or returning with much-needed things such as wood, food, and slaves. Soon the city would be gripped with problems, but for now, it was just brewing. However, the pact masters were getting anxious, and rumors among the ruling circles spoke about how they would eventually intervene should it get too bad. Meanwhile, to transport the payment, the SDC had to assemble quite the caravan, Though reduced to valuables, the total weight of the payment was still 47,250 pounds, and with camels being capable of carrying a maximum load of 300 pounds, that meant gathering 158 camels only for the transportation of half the payment. Since sending that amount of money across the 400 miles of desert and man waste that separated Katapesh from Alkenstar presented the wet dream of every highwayman in Garund, a host of 500 armed men had been hired for protection, which in turn required a host of additional people to provide services such as food and medical treatment. When all was said and done, the Grand Golden Caravan counted over 300 camels and nearly 1,000 people between soldiers, camel drivers, scouts, medics, slave masters, and what have you. And that's not even counting the hefty group of camp followers that gathered in its wake. Vorgok and Jack were sent to oversee the caravan, while Valinar and Hassan remained in Saltspit. Now, it's important to consider that Rakim's player had to leave us for a while as he traveled outside the country. So he had some leeway in keeping his character in the state he was in. Everything was discussed with him before doing anything. So it had his approval. He even told Valinar's player, Go ahead and surprise me. So, as long as I still have a character to play when I get back, you have a free ticket to do as you please. So, Valinar decided to turn him into a golem. Yes, he already ordered the construction of 50 golems and sent the region into economic meltdown in the process. But turning a party member into a golem had been a running joke of the party for years ever since he made his first evil cleric about a decade ago. We had talked about constructs some time ago during pizza break, and he was captivated by one alchemical golem from a source book I cannot remember at the moment. So his mind began working on the plan. 
he would need alchemists, apothecaries, a source of electricity, and a long list of nefarious devices to finish the job. The idea was to first create the body, which in this case was essentially a big homunculus. He modeled the body after the intelligent gorillas of the Mwangi expanses, but purple, since he decided he would use purple chemicals. A lot of blood was needed, which was unintentionally donated by a bunch of gorilla slaves that had been recently imported. Once the body was grown, he had to transfer Rakim's soul from his current body to the alchemical vessel, which was done through a judicious use of magic jar, and left his human form as a mere carcass. He still needed a sufficient amount of electricity to instill life into the body. They tried to hire a magician casting lightning bolt, but that didn't work. They then tried ten hired magicians casting lightning bolt, yet all it did was burn down a laboratory. After some research, they found out what they actually needed. Natural lightning. So Valinar was forced to assemble a caravan, and take the golem vat westward towards the Shattered Range, the mountains dividing the dry Katapeshi lands from the lush Mwangi jungles. Where anvil-shaped storm clouds would provide the power needed, he took a lot of brass with him and some builders in order to assemble the lightning catchers. Some previous scrying and teleportation handled the trip, and then spent a few days in the mountains as the builders worked on the lightning catchers and he himself on the complicated wiring required to properly jolt the body. In the meanwhile, Vorgok and Jack were leading the great golden caravan southward across the dunes. Though they had countered a few packs of gnolls that attempted to attack the caravan, the hired soldiers made quick work of them. However, the further south they went, the more they felt like they were being watched. The scouts were sent on regular intervals, but since they all returned with nothing to report, things proceeded calmly. That until Vorgok claimed to have seen an army following their trail. No one else could see it. So Jack attempted to ease things down by explaining the madness that was gripping his steel tooth friend. It was pointless, though, as Vorgok decided to charge rearwards, past the caravan and into the sands. Soldiers were unsure what to do, so they remained posted, all watched as a crazed barbarian rode into the distance and fought invisible foes. It just so happened that they were actually invisible foes. Vorgok's exposure to ethereal blasts from the between worlds had made him all sorts of crazy. His own dreamscapes had mixed with those of other people and other things, so he kept seeing things that were in someone else's imagination. His own body had started to fade at times, becoming half immaterial for short periods. However, this also had some unexpected benefits, such as being able to gaze into both the material and the ethereal planes simultaneously, which provided quite useful against a band of marauders that had chosen to travel under the guise of the ethereal. Impacting with force of a locomotive, Vorgok cut through the lines, breaking the spell and suddenly revealing a multitude well in the high hundreds. Battle ensued. While they fought bravely, the tide was against them. Whoever these men were, they had powerful support and were well equipped. In contrast, the STC had hired mostly second-hand mercenaries to act as soldiers, and half of them fled or got killed, the other half eventually realizing they were gone and either surrendering, escaping, or crawling into turtle formations that got quickly overwhelmed. Sure, Jack and Vorgok, mostly Vorgok, counted dozens of victims each, but they too got over their heads, eventually being brought down. Now, one thing is for Vorgok to be brought down, another entirely is to capture him. Several soldiers lost their hands trying to catch him, as the olfin giant chewed and masticated their extremities away when they got too close. At one point, no one dared come close, deciding to instead build a makeshift cage around him. The cage itself was no match for Gorgok's otherworldly fury, but Jack managed to get some sense into him, and offered to surrender, seeing as innocent camp followers were being butchered, and that the battle was lost in any case. They were eventually taken captive, after several poison darts managed to throw the barbarian into a deep slumber, and chains brought Jack down. It was evident these guys were not only after the gold, since otherwise they would have killed them. To the north, back in Saltspit, Hassan had his hands full with Valinar doing some spooky mad scientist stuff in the mountains, and Jack and Borgok traveling to another country at camel speed. The rogue was left to handle all the loose ends, which had started to pile up. The Plague Remember when Whip Master Concaf, the cyclops in charge of the slaves at the salt mines, warned the party about a growing infection? Well... It turned out that the breaking of the slaves' back didn't stop the disease from spreading. Much to the one-eye's bewilderment, and the lack of foresight on the party's behalf only helped to get out of control. Over a hundred had already died covered in pustules, and a hundred more were showing signs of going the same way soon. No one even knew how many others were sick. The city council had ordered an emergency burning of the bodies, but with it more dead showing up across Saltspit every day, they had a time bomb in their hands. Unease gave way to fear, fear gave way to rage, and soon uprisings were taking place across the city with stores being robbed and brass legionnaires hanged by the mob. Initially secluded in the party's palace, Hassan was forced into action when one of the merchants bathing at the site's oasis they had previously conjured inside the building 
which they had used as some sort of tourist attraction and garnered some extra cash, died in the middle of the courtyard. He contacted the prince through the crystal ball and requested the immediate dispatch of priests and medicaments, offering to pay for all the teleportation spells required. The flesh spawns. The process was slowly progressing. And while the byproducts were indeed horrendous, Apothecary Bin Shabaj, the guy they put in charge of overseeing the works, reported that they had reached a 10% success rate, and that two dozen elves had survived long enough to be carrying viable spawns. Hassan had all the discarded elven subjects being burned along with the plague subjects, so that at least covered those tracks. He was getting anxious, however, since the working spawns wouldn't be ready for at least three months, and they had already been contacted by the denizens of Lang. Some of them would be visiting Saltspit at an unknown, but probably premature date. This led to the idea of speeding up the process by infusing the elves with raw positive energy, so he ordered wizards to be brought, yet this led to another problem, a wizardly shortage. Even though there is indeed magic in the world, the STC had been abusing the available supply to grotesque levels. Teleportation and scrying had become the standard means for travel and communication, not just among the party, but among the many upper echelons of the company. More and more spellcasters were being employed to cover the increasingly more complicated and dangerous business ventures and some of the industrial units were using them up to the point of collapse. Casters in the mines to handle the elementals and keep the rifts stable. Casters in the nightmare bunkhouses to keep Slimy from becoming madness incarnate. The hags from stealing the goods and the workers from having their heads explode. Casters in the golden fountain to stabilize the dreamscape, to keep the kid secure, to move the liquid, and to speed up the construction of the mints. Casters in the fields surrounding the fountain, where dream leftovers and ethereal currents still cause all manners of problems. Casters in the palace to keep the artificial oasis with water in the substructure to power up the unusual air conditioning system and to guard the vaults, and the list went on and on. Sure, the current crisis starting in Catapish had put a stop to most salt imports, but judging it as just a temporary issue, the directorate had decided to maintain operations. As you can imagine, there simply was not enough spellcasters to keep up with this rate, and that's not even considering those who died in minor accidents or went insane from merely thinking about slimy. The STC had a dedicated body for spellcasting contracts, the Department of Arcane Services, which in turn was in charge of meeting the magical requirements of all the other departments, and its representatives had scoured the region looking for people to be hired. The wizardly covenants and academies in Katapesh, Nex, and Osirian had already taken notice, and though they had been showered with gold, were starting to get anxious at such an accumulation of power, as well as the influence the STC was achieving in the biz. Concerns ran the gamut from millennial covenants being broken down as its members were convinced with wealth beyond their dreams, to magical academies being emptied of students, including warnings regarding the excessive use of magic in unethical and uncontrolled ways, and all the terrible things that could happen because of this. As spellcasters became more and more scarce, the Department of Arcane Services was forced to start recruiting, just about anyone that could light a match with its fingers to meet the quotas. Though Hassan was largely uninterested by these issues so long as the money kept flowing, he did have to go through a particularly tense directorate meeting where the issues were brought up. They were simply put, no more spellcasters left in Eastern Garand. All were either already hired by the STC, killed in an STC operation, taken either by will or by force by members of the merchant court, forbidden by their orders or masters from participating, or altogether hidden or run away. It was a strange time to be a wizard in the lands of Katapesh. Now those who know about Galarian know that there are two wizardly nations right to the south of Katapesh, Nex and Geb, both founded in times immemorial by archwizards. Nex was a land of immensely powerful spellcasters, while Geb had turned to the arts of necromancy and everything there ran on zombie power. Both nations depended on their magic users on a cultural, strategic, and pretty much existential level. So this whole thing with the SDC attracting so much spell power had them pretty worried and upset. Problems had already started a while back, when a Nexian Arclord had been convinced to participate in the company after being granted a 4% share of their stocks. Since it was believed the STC could be in tandem with Nex's mortal enemies, Geb, both nations hold a very uneasy peace after centuries of conflict. So, the current situation only helped to increase tensions. To make matters even worse, the Department of Arcane Services reported the deeds of one Vernon Bundlebitter, chief of elemental herding in the Saltspit Katapesh route who had been stirring trouble by going all Bolshevik and was trying to form a union of spellcasters to demand better working conditions. If it had been some random miners, it would have been just a matter of getting some knolls and letting them loose on the protesters. But these guys were wizards, both dangerous if angry, and a scarce resource necessary to the operation. So the SDC was forced to negotiate, granting several benefits to the spellcasters' union, including such things as better pay, the creation of a schedule system to properly sort out working turns, and always treasured personal latrines. 
A library and a laboratory would have to be constructed for spellcasters to have a chance to develop personal projects. And in general, it gave the union a lot of leeway and influence over the company. Words had been discussed about giving the organization access to some percentage of the shares, but Hassan managed to block that deal. One good thing came out of the spellcasters' union formation, which was a more organized access to magic users, as well as an optimization on the use of those the STC already had under payroll. Though Bundle Bitter tried to keep the relation tense and strained for political gain, a turban-wearing gnome sorcerer and member of the union by the name of Baba Ganoush opted for a more cooperative approach and offered the directorate to handle the acquisition of spellcasters from distant locales. This would give the union control over who came in and caused future issues. But for now, the SDC was against the wall, and the board members were very anxious to get the deal going. A few days later, Valinar arrived in the company of a monstrous, dark, purple, oversized gorilla with particularly clever eyes. Several workers had died during the process back in the Shattered Range, as the cleric was not in the mood for safety measures, and electrocution from handling brass machinery during a thunderstorm took several out. Rakim's own awakening also served to crush some spines, and they had to spend several hours looking for him when he escaped. Calm emotions and a well-placed jolt of lightning took care of the burst of rage. And once the monk sorcerer Gorilla, or Gorilonk, had started to come to his senses, they headed back. Since Rakeem's player was going to come back in about two weeks, we decided his character would be kept locked away in the dungeons for the remainder, with Valinar and some helpers doing regular visits to help him accommodate to his new body. The cleric, however, did make sure to embed a control rune made out of brass into Rakeem's forehead, inscribed in a scroll that he would carry with him at all times and offer him control over his body. In the south, Jack and Vorgok were being held prisoners by the invisible marauders that struck the caravan and plundered their gold, and had been taken to a crumbling desert villa to the northeast. As it turned out, the bandits were under the command of a dreaded desert pirate by the name of Perot Le Fay. So that part served to do some dramatic sword and cape adventure, which ended with a sword fight while mounting a pegasus and a flying carpet among the exploding remains of a dune sailing ship and many cheesy dialogue lines. They also found some vials of mercurial water, drawn from the endless sea spreading at the base of the Mount Celestia, which later Jack found out was a legendary means for washing away sins and thus poured on his head in order to correct his alignment. He kept more for himself, arguing that the STC had a way to make people do really bad stuff and still feel good about it. Before Lefay's climactic defeat and mandatory, you have not seen the last of me. Prior to being engulfed by an explosion, however, they did manage to discover that they had been sent there by none other than Prince Osman bin Hasir, their most trusted associate and one of the major stockholders in the Saltspit Trading Company. To what purpose, it was yet unknown, but clearly the gold was a factor, as Lefay's men had brought a dozen desert oliphants to carry the treasure back to Katapesh. They decided to leave Vorgok in charge of recovering the treasure. While Jack would take the flying carpet they stole from Lefay's personal belongings to quickly return to Saltspit and give the heads up to the rest of the party. In theory, at least, it was a good idea. Just that neither of them properly factored Vorgok into the equation. So Jack gets back to Saltspit within a day, giving the news to Hassan and Valinar. Jack wanted to confront the prince via crystal ball, but Valinar advised prudence, reminding everyone that the prince still held valuable assets belonging to the company back in Katapesh, and that it would be best to pay him a personal visit, with the assurance that Vorgok was in control of the treasure. They took some days to tie up the aforementioned issues, before taking a portal to Katapesh. As it turned out, though, Vorgok had decided to take the initiative by mounting an attack on the prince's palace with an Oliphant stampede. The logistics of getting Oliphants to Katapesh were not that hard, considering the creatures were trained to go back and forth between the city and the spice farms of Selshazam to the south. The problem was getting them through the city gates, an issue which Vorgok solved by tying them together in a two-perot formation with enormously thick ropes taken from the nearby piers and going apeshit behind them until they panicked and began charging forward, steam rolling through the city streets. The barbarian himself traveled inside a boat he had tied to the last row of Oliphants, yelling, Now stomper, now crusher, now smasher and crunch, on splatter, on breaker, on splitter and crumbler. By the time the rest of the party had arrived, Vorgog's Oliphant assault was already cutting through the city, across Gold and Peacock Square, and into the prince's well-guarded, yet not Oliphant-resistant courtyard. A massive ground-shaking stomp which seemed to almost crumble the towering palace brought everyone to their knees as twelve ridiculously oversized pachyderms loaded with gold smashed against the gates, crushed most of the palace guards, and broke everything there that could be broken. And then some. It's like some evil version of the pilgrimage of Mansa Musa to Mecca, which also involved a lot of salt and incidentally devalued gold in Egypt to the point that it led to a Middle East-wide depression. 
Only instead of piety and charity, it's being made possible by murder, slavery, backstabbing, and deals with extra-dimensional entities of horror. While everyone had to commend Vorgok for his hands-on approach, the whole thing really cut down the options regarding finding a solution. In a rather impulsive move, the party decided to kidnap the prince while the barbarian pretty much disintegrated the abode and everyone in it, and headed back to Saltspit. Impulsive, I say, because amidst all the trouble, screaming, and rumble, they completely forgot that they had left behind millions of gold pieces. Sure, the founder could give them back in a week since the thing was fully operational, but that was still two and a half months away. And after all that happened, it seemed they would be needing that golem army rather soon. On the sidelines, dumping all that gold back into Katapesh was the last strain on its already troubled economy. Last time, they spent ludicrous amounts of money, causing severe financial stress in the city as prices went bananas in all directions and clogging the trade networks. But in a way, the effect was constrained by the fact that most of the money ended up in a rather small circle of merchants. And given time, it would have fixed itself. This time, however, over 3 million pieces of gold had been laid out all across the city, falling into the hands of anyone who happened to be there and managed to not get crushed by the tidal wave of Oliphants. This meant the gold would strike pretty much on all levels of the economy as the people ran to spend the money on just about anything. Within a matter of days, the price of the most basic goods skyrocketed both because of the inflated currency mass and because the buyers themselves started gobbling up products in order to sell them later as they started perceiving the continuous price increases. This created a widespread speculative bubble on almost every imaginable product, from hand baskets to real estate, which in the ill-regulated city of Katapesh could burst at any moment. Not to mention the people were getting furious as their newly found riches suddenly devalued by a factor of 100. If there was any time for the packmasters would be moved to intervene, that time was now. This concludes part two of the amazing story of the industrious rogue and his party. Stay tuned for part three. Tell me what you think in a comment down below. Before we take our leave, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, All Things D&D. Stay tuned for more amazing Dungeons & Dragons content every week.